<laughs> There's a lot of it. Uh, whiskey, bourbon, all of those things become very, 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 very popular. Can you hear me all right? Yes, very good. Can you hear yourself all right? Yeah. Now, do you see why we're wearing these? Yeah. It almost sounds like we're on our own, like, uh, talk radio show or something. Right, right. And you start talking just a little different, like, hmm, what could I sound like on the radio? <laughs> All right, guys, this is uh, my good buddy, Richard, and we happen to have two things in common. One, we're both big fans of bourbon, as you all know. Um, this would be a small selection that you can't 100% see here. Um, and we also are both big fans of bird dogs. We've gotten the opportunity to go hunting a few times together. Uh, not often enough, but he was nice enough to come and sit down and try a few of these new bottles of bourbon that I've got. And bullshit about bird dogs sounds good to me perfect all right so to start off with you were telling me that you've got bourbon or whiskey combination yes both coming from every single state now it's kind of right. the, the goal is the collection yeah my son-in-law is, is and uh i don't remember which state he brought that was really bad <laughs> but uh, I want to say, I want to say it was one from Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's and, right. And it's Missouri's the ugly, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. So that would make sense to me. We used to, so when I was growing up, we lived in Missouri for a little while. Um, we lived in Stanbury, which is not too far outside. It's a really small town, not too far outside of St. Joe. Um, so that kind of Northwest corner of the state. And when we lived there, we referred to the fact that we lived in misery. That was, exactly. uh, that was the way that my mother always spoke of it. We lived in misery. So, uh, sorry for all the hate Missouri guys, but Hey, you chose to live there. Let's see here. All right. So we've got a little game to start off with. We are going to play a uh, taste test with. Jefferson Ocean, aged at sea. We have, I found this recently. It's a bottle of Voyage 10, which I looked up was back in, I think, 2012, maybe. Voyage 10. What, what ocean, what, or what part do so, they do this in? So that each one of these tells a different little story. Pull the tag on that one here. So this one is 17. It says formed and um, it says the Pacific Ocean on 17 here. All storms that occurred during the voyage 17 formed and blew themselves out in the middle of the Pacific. Even the China Sea, notorious as the most active region for typhoons, was unusually quiet. So not a whole lot happened, um, and it says, so this was a pretty mild overall sailing time, but primarily in the Pacific Ocean. What is that one specifically Okay, saying? this is 19. Yep. It crossed the equator four times. Ooh. Went to five continents. Uh, was extreme contrast in temperature as the ship transferred, transitioned from winter to summer. And vice versa. So lots and lots and lots of change. Right. So we've got, I've got this, um, it's like a whiskey club thing. If you guys are interested, I'll throw um, a link in the description below so that you can actually sign up for this. But it's called uh, Flavier and it's not available in all states. Not all states allow you to actually ship whiskey and different types of spirits around. But um, Kansas is one of them that allows you and there's a few other. But it gives you, it's called a flavor wheel. That's what they refer to it as. So this will tell you the individual flavors that we should be able to get hints of or tastes of um, from this specific bottle of whiskey. And this is the 19, which is a weeded. Here. Yep. It's a, um, instead of using rye, they're using wheat. Now somebody's going to correct me on this for sure, but that one says full weeded. The wheat supposedly isn't as strong a flavor of grain and actually... Um, allows the the sweetness from the corn to like provide a sweeter overtone. So it says you get hints of caramel, sweet flavoring, vanilla, cinnamon. This is actually a sweeter flavored bourbon. So we'll go ahead and pour just a little bit here. 
Uh, Kat actually got these for my birthday. So I'm new to, to sipping glasses, but um, okay. you just get, we'll just get, we are going through a few here. So we'll just try a little bit. You said we're supposed to swirl and smell this. Huh? Yeah, swirl it. Now, when you smell, I watched the video neat, so I'm actually an expert now. Um, <laughs> you're give, you're, give su- <laughs> you're supposed to inhale basically with your mouth open. So you kind of breathe through your mouth, breathe through your mouth with the whiskey up to your nose, and then you kind of get some flavors of it without burning your nostrils. Like if you just totally sniff the whiskey, you go, whoo, burn your nose, mm-hmm. but you open your mouth a little bit. And then you can kind of flavorly smell slash and taste what's going on there. Smells sweet. Mm -hmm. It's it's a very sweet bourbon. You know, I mean, to say whiskey is sweet is a weird thing, you know, without being a liqueur or something like that. But And with a little whiskey in there, you got to tip it a long way. Oh, I reckon. It's not as sweet as I expected it to be. But it's, it's mild. It's easy to drink. What do you think? Uh, to me, it's got a little peppermint flavor. Peppermint. Uh, let's see what we've got. According to them, that would be close to that. They're actually talking about um, there is a hint of pepper, which would be different than peppermint, but um, cinnamon, which could have that, that kind of spice it. to it. Yep. Um, tropical, as if it's going to gain some tropical flavor from riding around in the ocean. Yeah, it's the equator thing. Uh, yeah, it crossed back and forth. <laughs> um, it says cake, toffee, honey. I don't get all of those, but typically, so I use this app a lot when I'm looking at new whiskeys or I go, hey, will I maybe like this before I buy a, a bottle of it? Um, things that are heavily flavored in caramel typically have a little bit milder flavor, which I tend to like. Um, things that say heavy in oak and smoke are not usually my cup of tea, but so that is one. Now let's go ahead and pull up here. That was, that was number 19. That was 19. Now let's right. see what the 17, this was the 17 don't, said it was really mild. Don't, don't show me. Let me smell and see if I can get close. Okay. Jefferson. Okay. So. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a small hint as far as the fact that this one has what will be a strong, um, flavor once you figure it out. Once you figure it out, you will be able to tell that it is there. Once I tell you, if you don't get it on your own, you tell it's a it's a thing that you would not typically consider being part of bourbon, but it is there. I can't get it by smell. Can yeah. you? I'm no I'm no aficionado. I'm not a, a whiskey sommelier or whatever. <laughs> I'd either. Oh, that's really mild. It is. I think I I personally am a bigger fan of the 19 than the 17. But let's see if sometimes I get fooled by proof. Like if it's a higher proof whiskey, um, this is 90. They're both 90 proof. So there's no difference in there. I feel that the 17 has a little more mm, bite to it or something. Something's there. Yeah, but I don't get a distinct flavor like I did with the 19. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, it for sure is, grab that bottle over there. This is, um, I'll tell you, this is uh, the secret, even though you've never had this either. So this is something that Kat got me, which is kind of a a harder to get, harder to find, and I hadn't even heard of it. Um, But she got it, it says in 1916, just before the prohibition, my family's entire whiskey inventory was seized by the federal government, never to be seen again, confiscated. Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey is a tribute to the vanished barrels. So this bottle wasn't actually seized. I misunderstood that. But this is a tribute to the barrels of bourbon and uh, to the opportunities lost. So this is supposed to be, I don't know if it seems supposed to be flavored the same, but it's to say huzzah to all the whiskey that was lost. (laughs) But this one, I'm going to pour these side by side. So this is your second tasting glass here. 
Um, this is supposed to taste like that 17. This has the same main flavor that's a weird one for whiskey, in my opinion. But you can get it a lot more with this. Once you hear what I'm saying, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, now I smell it. Now I taste it. I was told you're supposed to taste whiskey as if you're sipping hot coffee. And when you're really trying to play this game, not just, you know, drinking whiskey and whatever, you're supposed to you sip it like it's hot coffee or something. Okay, now, are you maybe, ready for it? Maybe it's because something I've never had before. Yep, it, it's, it's completely new to me. I've never seen it on these lists. I've never seen it anywhere until these two bottles. Apple. Now, try again, thinking Apple. Green delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. I mean, you it can, is. it's there. And you go back to this one, get kind of like a, and you go, just smell that again. You go, apple. Mm -hmm. It's there. That's the weird thing that's not typically in a whiskey. Oh, baby. Apple. Huh. It's weird. All right. So, guys, we've talked a little bit about a couple different whiskeys here. We've got these 19, 17, and then we actually have a 10. Now, um, I've heard from people, and I don't, I don't say that I can 100% agree, but they said that the early versions of the Jefferson Ocean was pretty rocky, and it's gotten better with age, if you will. Now, I've even seen that there's bottling of uh, Voyage 22 somewhere floating around, but I have not seen access to that, so we'll find out if we can get a hold of it, and you'll have to come back out and tell me uh, what you think about that. But we have uh, 10 that I just found. It was like tucked in the back shelf, and I was like, what is that? The label looks different. Um, and it had a bunch of dust on the bottle. It had, I don't know who, who knows how long it's been there. I'll be. Um, but this is actually a cask strength, which, um, like I was saying, you're at 112 proof versus 90 proof. And I always feel like I can't taste the flavor the same. The hotter it gets, you just taste like a little more burn than anything else. So there are that. We have played with the Jefferson Ocean and the Kentucky Owl confiscated edition. Now, to switch subjects a little bit, because we we mentioned we're going to talk about bird dogs somewhere in this whiskey sipping adventure. Um, I want to ask you, when did you get started with bird dogs? Uh, when I was a kid at home, my dad had bird dogs. Really? What kind of bird dogs did he have? Uh, the first one he ever had was a pointer. Uh <laughs> Oh, well, probably pretty good for the wolf for pointers, <laughs> but typical full speed balls to the wall everywhere all the time. Yep, yep, all the time. Best retriever you ever seen in your life, really? Because when he retrieved, it was at lightning speed, <laughs> and he he I mean he'd never miss. But we hauled him in the back of the truck. We never had a dog box or nothing. Yeah, Just farm kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and. We had some friends up from Texas was hunting. Was going down the road about 40. And we had enough guys to where some of them were riding in the back. It was a pretty nice day. Mm -hmm. One of them was digging his pockets and found an empty shotgun shell and flipped it over the side. That dog went to retrieve it. <laughs> but did he make it back from that one? Yep. Didn't hurt him. But you, could, you could not hurt that dog. <laughs> That's the way it seems like it is. Like uh, the more expensive the horse or the more expensive the dog, the better exactly. the chance they are to hurt themselves. And the more like those mutts or the you know, farm dogs, it seems yep. seem like anything could kill them. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So now you run short hairs now. Right. I've, I've went, uh, well, after that pointer, we got a short hair. Okay. Which uh, was a really good dog. I mean, he had, he hunted like short hairs, but he had stamina. I mean, well, we hunted, uh, there was one time he didn't, he wasn't home for like eight nights in a row. He hunted every day, sun up <laughs> to sundown and never quit. I mean, that dog would go and go and go. That's awesome. That's awesome. Did he have the ability to shut it off though? When he was home? Yep. Yep, when it was when the day was over, he'd he'd rest. See, I heard a story 
about, uh, I met a gentleman when I guided at a place down in Texas. It was uh, an Orvis endorsed lodge, a place is called Greystone Castle. You drive up and and from a distance, this place looks like a castle. You drive up, it's like the thing's built out of cinder blocks and it looks kind of hankier when you get there. But still, I mean, it's castle-ish and you are staying in the walls of this castle. They have built all the rooms out of it and everything else. I did not. I was a guide. I was a peasant, basically. But um, it looks really cool and they've done a lot to it. Now, the gentleman that I met there guiding, um, he said that he actually ran bird dogs back in the day for J.B. Hunt himself. He was, um, and he got there and he had this old bird dog that um, he took to run in, would be what would be considered all age trials. And have you heard that term or do you know what I'm talking about specifically? Uh-huh. Okay, so field trials are broken into a bunch of different levels, all age being the biggest running, I'm not going to say the best of the field trial. It's just a different category where, you know, you're talking – a half mile dog kind of thing where they've got scouts and the scouts are necessary in order, and necessary in order to be able to keep up with where that dog is actually at. And you see the streak, the white streak running across the hillside, you know, and that's the mark of that all age dog. That's really going to go out and win. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about this dog that um, they didn't really use e collars when he was doing this because they weren't a thing yet. And he had this dog, then the dog would ride in uh, Mr. Hunt's pickup truck, the back of his pickup truck. And just like you're talking about, he'd pull up to the trial and, you know, he was his handler for him. So he'd go get him out of the back of the truck. And as soon as the trial was done, he'd run the whole trial and then he'd just jump back up in the back of the truck and lay down. You know, I mean, you think about a dog that would be wired like that, you wouldn't think they'd actually have the ability to shut it off. And it's the same thing. I mean, they had a true like an on switch that was broken on. And then at the same time, it was just as hard off. Right. And, uh, and that's the way that short hair was. It was, I don't know how many nights he'd just sleep in the backseat of the car. Yeah. He just, I mean, he, when it was, when the hunt was over, he would lay down anywhere, rest, all there was to it. He was ready for the next day. So you're saying your dad had bird dogs when you were a kid. So bird dogs have been a huge part of your life. Oh yeah. Yeah. I had, uh, I lost a bird dog one time when there was like three weeks hunting season left Mm. and didn't have a dog. But come the last weekend, I thought, oh, I got to go out. It's last weekend. Yeah. That hunt lasted about five minutes. I started walking. I got 100 yards down the field and I looked around. There was no dog and there was no fun. It was no hunt. Yeah. I turned and went back to the house. That was yep. the end of the season. I understand that completely. I mean, that's how I I started bird hunting. Um, we were the bird dogs, you know, more or less. And um, I didn't really grow up in a hunting family, uh, surprisingly enough. My dad and mom didn't really hunt, but um, her parents hunted. My dad's family didn't hunt at all, but her um, dad hunted and her brother hunted. And I got the opportunity to go with them once or twice. And um, I actually believe the, the first time that I went – uh, bird hunting. It was actually with a friend of the family that took me along with, and, um, the spark kind of got ignited with hunting in general with, um, my grandpa and uncle took me deer hunting and I shot a doe and that was kind of the beginning stages of hunting in general. And I went, well, I have a, I have a 12 gauge muzzle loading shotgun, double barrel. It's a, would be Navy arms to reproduction and the hammers actually uh, shaped kind of like it's, it's a shaped like a uh, fish. Basically it's got etching. So it's got scales and everything else. And it looks you know kind of like a fish that comes down. And so I had this shotgun and I went, well, hunting with a shotgun. I mean, I can bird hunt. And I found somebody that was a, like I said, it was a friend of was actually our, um, physicians, this is a PA that the family doctor, if you will. And he said that I could go along hunting with him. And I shot my first pheasant with a 12 gauge muzzle loading shotgun. <laughs> and I didn't know if I hit it or not. Cause I pulled up and went, and then this big cloud of smoke. <laughs> and when the smoke cleared, he's hooping and hollering, you know, from 40, 50 yards away. He's like, you killed that bird. And I'm like, where did it go? You know, I don't, I didn't have any idea. And, um, that day he had a lab and 
uh, bless his heart for taking me. I mean, it was a big spark for my interest in the sure. hobby, but we spent half the damn day looking for that dog. You know, I mean, he was with us for a little while and then he got in the creek and ran some deer or did something. And right. then it was like calling somebody to get in the truck and run around the other end of the draw to try and see if we could find that. Right. That was the only bird that we got up that day. And I got the opportunity to shoot, shoot at it and I killed it. And, but that was it because we spent the rest of the day looking for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, you said a muzzle loader. I got a double barrel muzzle loader. Really? Yeah. I did with it for oh seven or eight years. Really? And I even took to the trap, to the skeet shoot one day. But anyway, I got to tell you my muzzleloader story. Okay. I had made up my mind I was going to kill every bird in Kansas. That yeah. Is, and I've killed everyone but the prairie chicken. Really? Do you have any spots you know how to kill prairie chickens at? I mean, do you have uh, any spots where you can get on them? I haven't been in so many years. I don't even know now. Okay. But that's the one thing I didn't kill with the chit. But it come time for turkey, and I hate turkeys, and I hate turkey hunting. <laughs> but I had to take it to get yeah. one. I killed my first turkey with that same shotgun. Did you really? Yes. Well, anyway, so my boy, he's a big turkey hunter. Yes. He he calls up. He's hey. He says, I, I know where you can shoot your turkey with your muzzle. He knows how bad I hate it. He says, <laughs> this is your chance. So I asked him what the deal was. He told me. So all right. There was a place over we 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 farmed that had turkeys on it and there was and i didn't care if it was a jake it just had to be a tom turkey. legal turkey that's right kill it so i get out my book and i start reading about how to load this thing and well it was real vague about how to load for a turkey (laughs) but i thought well it's a pretty big bird if a little's good more's better see (laughs) i got an idea where this is going well i loaded up two pretty good loads in that muzzle loader and we went over where he's going to hunt it was in the afternoon, and there was just a little bit of a roll on that field. Uh-huh. And it was an old feed field from, from last fall. Boy, was all, I had a blind on one side, and I come over on this other side, and I grabbed me a few sticks and a draw and yep. throw them together, and I hunker down behind it and stick a decoy out there and blow the call. Right away, I hear a gobble. <laughs> I sit, and I listen, I call again. Sure enough, here are three toms come over the hill. I mean, be lining right for it. And I thought, man, for once my boy was right, it ain't going to get any easier than this. Yep. I was laid down on the ground, which is my first mistake, <laughs> on my belly with that muzzle loader here. And when I seen him coming, I already picked out the one I wanted. It turned out he was a pretty nice Tom. He had oh, a seven, eight-inch beard. Yeah. Weighed 18 or so. Anyway, he comes up here. He walks right up between me and a decoy. And he's kind of strutting around there. And I've got the hammer back, and I'm pointed right at him, and all he has to do is turn. And he does, and I pull the trigger, and I left that blind. And that turkey, there was no flop, no wiggle, just boom. (laughs) (laughs) And when we cleaned that bird, there was seven BBs went into him, and seven went plumb through out the other side. There wasn't a BB in that bird. <laughs> Goodness, I can only imagine. So, um, speaking of good, good, some is good, more is better. That wasn't the case. It is not the case no. with the muzzle loaders, and you can get you can get in a little bit of trouble with them that way. Exactly. But uh, that's funny. It uh, that was my turkey story. That was my muzzle loader turkey story. Now, for anybody watching that doesn't know, the reason that you were waiting for the turkey to turn is because typically you're going to shoot the turkey in the head. Right, And if he strutted out, fanned out, you can't necessarily see where that head is because you got the big fan out back and he was probably face to you. And granted, you could body shoot him, but why wreck the bird when you exactly. can shoot him in the head and he's just going to dance around. So he's waiting for him to turn. And that's what the reason behind that was. But I, you know, I never have shot a turkey with a conventional shotgun where the BBs went clear through. Mm-mm. But I mean, there wasn't a BB in that bird. There were seven holes in and seven holes out. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's a really good story. Now, I think it is time that we probably go back to a little bit of bourbon. Works for me. Okay, so we have done this. And this and this. <clears throat> Try just a shot of this stuff here. This is the number 10. Now, this is the dusty one? Yeah, this is the dusty one. It's been around a little while. 
I don't, I don't know what year that actually is. Let me look and see. I was speaking with, I was going to tell you the flavors on that other one that you didn't want to know until you tasted it. It's caramel and apple are the two big ones. And then vanilla, which is the same kind of undertones as the last one, because they have a similar flavor. They're pretty mm-hmm. easy to drink. And then it has a bunch of um, salty cinnamon toffee, same kind of things. And instead of tropical, it says exotic fruit. Huh. So more or less, they have pretty similar flavors to them, except you can definitely tell that apple in the other one than this. Now, right. this is the the tenure, which is um, I'm jumping the gun. I'm already smelling. No, go for it. That got to be some caramel in this one too. I would guess. I mean, they're they're bourbons. This ocean flavor stuff is pretty similar. And I think that caramel flavor they describe as um oh that's hot yes and that's what the like i need almost like a splash of water in it to be able to take the the bite out so i can and see and this one says uh sweet cinnamon dark chocolate which i don't ever get chocolate and um but then vanilla and then fruit and then coffee and spicy, and then barely a hint of caramel in there. Um, it, but for me, I went, whoo, that's hot, exactly what you did. And then I took and went with a splash of water, and then that that kind of tames it down a little bit. It's hard. I mean, when you get that much heat to it, it gets hard to barely tell anything other right. than burn. Let's do, let's do this here. Okay, so we got a little water because we both need. So now, if you take again, because because I'm an expert, because I watched Neat. <laughs> okay. You take a sip of water, and then you sip your whiskey, and you've still got enough of that water in your mouth, or you hold a little bit more of the water in your mouth, and then you can kind of get the flavors. You took and were efficient with it and just poured a little water in the glass, which is normally the way that I would do it. But Well, that took the bite off. Yes. Uh, it doesn't have as strong a flavor as those, those others. Mm-mm. It's supposed to be sweet. And then cinnamon, which I always, anytime it tells me there's cinnamon in it and I look at it afterward, I'm like, cinnamon, I don't, you know, I don't get. Uh, cinnamon cookies or any, I don't know. I don't really taste the cinnamon as much as it just tastes kind of what I categorize more as like a spicy. It's got kind of like a. Yeah, that's definitely the least favorite. Mm -hmm. So it's true, folks. The uh, Jefferson Ocean aged at sea gets better on the equator. Yep. Yep. On the equator. (laughs) Bottle number 19. Bottle number 19. That's what we're going with. Okay. So we've got, let's go ahead and a little bit in here. Okay. So this is another fun one. It is called rabbit hole and rabbit hole is a Kentucky straight rye whiskey. And this one is one that I found recently. Just enough to taste it. We don't need to fall over. I don't even know if you can see those on the camera, but they're there up front. So let's go. We'll pull this up again in the description, guys. I'm going to throw up a link to this um, whiskey thing that we're looking at that's showing all of these flavor wheels. Let's go. It's the box rail is what they call it. Kentucky straight rye whiskey. It's a two-year-old whiskey, so it's not very old. Now, um, in order to be categorized as bourbon, I think it has to be aged a minimum of four years. And so this is considered rye whiskey only because it's two years old instead of a minimum of four. It also has to be like 51% corn. There's a bunch of things like, so all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon Bourbon. kind of deal. Yep. Yep. And this one supposedly won some awards at some competition in New York. New York, New York. 
All right, what do you think of that one? Still just been smelling. Still smelling. You're going to laugh when I tell you what I smell. What do you smell? Kahlua, uh, that, uh, Kahlua? Kahlua cream. Okay, let's see if there's anything in there. <laughs> let's see if there's anything in here. Is this the right one? Box rail. Yep. Okay. Um, well. It's good. So this says spicy, which I don't know exactly how spicy is a flavor, but I feel them with uh, spicy um, caramel, pepper, earthy. Charred, fruit, licorice, and then honey. It's pretty good. It is pretty good. Yeah. It's one that um, I would say that most of the time, if I'm going to make something like a Manhattan, not a Manhattan typically, like a, like an old fashioned, right? A whiskey drink that's got a little bit of stuff mixed in it. Usually I use a rye whiskey if I'm going to do that because you've got a little bit of extra flavors to it. And then the other things that you're adding, a little simple syrup, the little muddled fruit, add some sweetness to it, and the rye can be a hint of more bitter or something like that. But. Uh, I can taste the char, I think. Yeah. Yep. Yep, it almost tastes, I mean, tastes burnt a yeah. little bit. Like, um, like uh, I, I would even say, to the extent of like a burnt uh, marshmallow, you can roast campfire. Because there's rarely an opportunity. Licking the inside of a stovepipe. There you go. I've never done that, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I would imagine that's exactly how it would, uh, it was exactly how it would taste. You know, because I wouldn't even categorize it as like a smoke thing, you know, cigarette right. or whatever smoke. No, but charred like burnt. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's interesting. When you hear those, it makes it easier to kind of pick out individual right, things, right. or at least trick your mind into thinking you're smelling, smelling, and tasting. I don't, uh, I don't particularly care for the Canadian whiskeys because they're always sweet, always wheat, sweet. Oh, sweet. I'm not, I'm not that big a fan of sweet bourbon or whiskey, and I don't taste any sweetness in this. Um, what did I say? Uh, and and that doesn't categorize any sweet. Like the other one said sweet and right. main flavors, caramel and all of those things I would associate more with sweet. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this is it'll give you a little story behind some of these. It says, <laughs> um, it says a boy likes scotch meets girl, girl likes bourbon, bourbon, uh, boy likes bourbon, boy and girl. What does this even make? Start making booze. Um, we've all been there, right? <laughs> meet the, these two. Uh, it's a true story. And they are uh, created this rabbit hole whiskey. So it says here, rye. Think of it as uh, bourbon's edgier cousin. It's known for impairing what many call a spicy or fruity flavor to the whiskey. Imparting, excuse me. Uh, rye distilled from at least 51% rye is not so sweet and tends to have a spicier body, which is why it's characterized as a cocktail made from rye instead of bourbon is drier. So it's, uh, like I said, typically, um, when I'm making an old fashioned, I'm adding those extra sweet flavors too. So if we start with the sweetness, if you will, then it almost gets overly powering sweet. But this, any kind of rye whiskeys are typically going to cut that back. So you right. kind of mellow it out. Yeah. No, that was good. That's, I kind of like this one is a new one that I found. And, um, another gal that, uh, actually just picked up some dogs from us. She had said, I just found this rabbit hole, um, rye whiskey. And I'm like, I have that, but I haven't tried it yet. She said, yeah, she really likes it. So I also agree. Let's you go. know, my, uh, my dad didn't like the taste of whiskey. Really? Yeah, he, he did. He just, but he, uh, he had a heart attack when he was 43. Oh, wow. And really young. Yeah. That was back in the, you know, if you had a heart attack back then, they didn't know anything about it. They just, you stayed in the hospital for six weeks and then went home and hoped for the best. 
Yeah. Well, a doctor told him, says, get a bottle of whiskey and keep a bottle of whiskey on hand. Okay. And when you get your chest gets tight stuff, just take a swig. That was his doctor's. Is that supposed to be like a, from a blood thinning standpoint? Exactly. Okay. Well, he didn't like the taste of whiskey. So every time he'd have to go get a bottle, he'd ask him, he says, what have you got that is the smoothest? Tip up the bottle and drink whiskey. Yeah. And they were on, him and mom were on vacation somewhere sometime. And he was needing a bottle. So he went in the liquor store and asked the guy. And the guy says, I got just what you need. Got him a bottle of Mattingly Moore. Have you ever heard of it? I have not. We're going to look it up real quick. Mattingly Moore. And that was, he brought it home, and that was all he ever drank after that. Do you know how to spell it? Uh Uh-uh. Okay. That Mm. was the smoothest. I mean, you could tip it up and drink it like it was a beer. Mattingly Moore Distillery and Whiskey. So, Did you find one? Yep. Mattingly, uh, Mattingly and Moore Bourbon Wine Chateau. All right, let's go. It's spelled M-A-T-T-I-N-G-L-Y. Okay, so my fun little whiskey club thing does not have any information about them, but we can pull up their actual... Are they still in business? So Mattingly and Moore says from Heaven Hill Distillery. The distillery was founded in 1935, immediately after Prohibition ended. It says in 1996, more than 90,000 barrels and one of their product uh, production buildings were destroyed in a fire. It's almost 24 million bottles worth of premium American whiskey. Okay. So, um, he- Heaven Hill Distillery also makes uh, Elijah Craig bourbon. Have you heard of that? Uh-uh. Okay. So, that's um, a more modern day. So, let's go to their, let's go to their Heaven Hill Distillery here. Okay, so I have uh, McHenry uh, Kennan, Kenna, excuse me, Henry McKenna, single barrel, uh, tenure. I have that bottle in here, which is one of theirs. So we'll look at that here in just a minute. Rittenhouse Rye, uh, Larceny, I've heard of. I feel Elijah Craig, small batch, that's one. Um, they've got several different flavors. Evan Williams would be the more n- name brand there. I think these go hand in hand. I don't know if they make well, it anymore. Well, Evans Williams is pretty smooth. Yeah. I bet that was real similar to that he had. Mattingly Moore Distillery. So they have a, f- I mean, they have a Facebook page. They've got to have something here. We're going to find, we're going to figure this out. Okay. That look, you recognize the bottle? Yep. That looks that right? Is, yep, that's what, exactly what it looked like. Okay. So we've got a bottle of Mattingly and more M&M coming. We'll have to figure out how good it really was or is. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Okay, so let's go ahead and open this one. Now, this is going to change directions all the way around. We talked about this a little bit. This is Knob Creek. It is, in fact, select bourbon. And this is a uh, single barrel select, and it's a store pick. So basically what that means, I was talking to you a little bit about this. Basically what that means is the... um, (laughs) Liquor store. That's the word I was looking for. The liquor store um, gets the opportunity. They talk to the Knob Creek dealer and say, um, what are the the individual barrels? And they test them and they say, ooh, this is the one that we really like. And then they get a whole barrel bottled for their store. The barrel's already created, but then it's bottled and sold to them. And then they can call that their special store pick, so on and so forth. So... We're not going to have a good flavor wheel on this one because this is a single barrel that won't have a distinct. This is individual to itself here. Let's go. Okay, that's a lot darker than anything else we've tried so far. Got a sweet smell. Mm.
Breathe it out now. Breathe it out. This is 120 proof, which is why it's hot. Yep. <laughs> 60% alcohol by volume. So this is the bottle. Okay, so take a sip of water. And then... And then I'll cut that just a little bit and you get the, cut the bite, get a little more of the flavor. I'm not even going to guess because we don't have any guide. <laughs> no, other than the bite, it's pretty smooth bourbon. Yeah, you just got to cut it with something. Yeah. Water works. Ice cubes. Yeah, ain't bad. Mm, it bites. Yes. You need the you need the water. Yeah. Okay. So you said bird dogs as a boy. Where did you go from pointers and then you had a short hair growing up? Where did you go between being the little boy and being the man that you are today and bird dogs? I mean, there's a lot uh, in between there. Was there a time period where you were without bird dogs? You have them through Never was. Never was. Okay. Other than that one time when mine died with like three weeks of season left. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got married and my first bird dog I had on my own was a half pointer, half short hair. Okay. This is an interesting topic because um, we put a lot of emphasis today and especially, I mean, I run a short hair breeding program, purebred short hairs, the the whole nine yards, right? Um, I would say a good portion of the, a good portion of the, yeah, it's whoo, yeah, stout. I, I get enough water on that one. <laughs> we, uh, we, we say the flavor is good, Knob Creek, but the bite is more than we were interested in this evening. So uh, I'm just saying the, <laughs> The half bred or mutt, if you will, bird dogs um, were a big part of the generation that taught me bird dog hunting. I mean, uh, nobody had purebred dogs. I mean, my uncle, I believe a big portion of the dogs, they had a short hair lab cross. They had Brittany pointer crosses. A couple of my uncles he's talked about as his best dogs were Brittany pointer crosses. Right. So you said you had a pointer short hair cross. Pointer hair shorter cross. Good dog. Little, uh, it was real light boned, a little female. Okay. So definitely got a little more of the pointer side of things. But hunted more like a short hair. Okay. What do you mean by that? Uh, not balls to the wall. Yeah. You know, a little, a little more, more under control. Uh, kind of at, at least once in a while, look where you were. <laughs> a little more cooperation. <laughs> but one thing about her, I totally hated. In fact, I got rid of her when she was about a three-year-old for that reason alone. She didn't like water. At all? At all. Hmm. You can get it across a garden hose. <laughs> <laughs> I dropped a quail run time on the other side of the creek, right on the edge. Yeah. And she stood there two foot from that bird and would not pick it up, not cross that water and pick it up. Really? She would not not go in water. Hmm. See, that was the one thing about her I just despised. I just hated her for it. And I, I, I mean, I don't know if I've... Uh, I've had a few pointers. I've trained a few pointers. Um, I learned, I'll tell you my pointer story. Okay. I learned early in, I've got a, a soft spot in my heart for an English pointer. I mean, the style, the just sheer bird dog to them. They're, they're a special breed. And the heart, you got to admire the heart. Of the heart. Them. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this specific female uh, that taught me everything that I needed to know about pointers. Okay. She was, uh, what would it be? She was double bred. And before this is over, I will remember, so I don't deal with the pedigrees a whole lot anymore, but it's a, it's a well-known name in the pointer world. And if I think of it, I'll throw it in there. If I don't think of it, I'll have to keep thinking, but she was double bred. So she's well-bred. Um, she's a well-bred English pointer little female. Her name was Jenny, G-I-N-N-Y, 
or Jenny, depending on which papers that I got for her that you looked at. So we kind of combined the two and just referred to her as Jenny all the time. I mean, it was just, and she kind of responded, you know, that happy go lucky tail head bobbing the same way the whole time, Mm -hmm. you know, like there's not a whole lot going on up there, but they're happy. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's just, yeah, that's like just a, a point. Like a greyhound. You know what? God gave the greyhound speed he took out of the brains. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that too. We've gotten, uh, we've got an opportunity to see a few greyhounds. So we go up to Abilene. We're going to jump around a little bit, but we go up to Abilene to a reproductive specialist up there and they primarily do greyhounds. So right. every time I bring one of the boys up to do a collection or do anything else, they always get a tease and the tease would be a female in heat that is prime time or very close to that. He gets the opportunity to try and mount and then gets collected. So that's his tease. And they almost always are greyhounds. Mm-hmm. I mean, and Dr. Law up there actually teased me. He said, I could have actually got a pointer today because we have a pointer in today for a breeding. <laughs> and I was like, ah, they, they're good with greyhounds now. So, um, but the pointer, Jenny, I learned everything I needed to. And now you talk about heart. Um, she was down there with me and guided in uh, Texas. And the Greystone Castle place I was at, we ran all winter long. And that was ended up through the end of the season was the end of March. And there were some times in Texas in February and the beginning part of March that it's 70 plus during the day, right? I've got a whole string of short hairs at six, seven dogs with me. To, Cause I'm down there for three, four months. You run their butts off every day. They get tired. You need to right. rotate. And, um, she was my go-to dog when it was 70 degrees or warmer. If it was over 70 degrees, you put her on the ground, she'd run the rest of the day and she would never look back. She didn't want water. She didn't want anything. I don't know how she was borderline super dog. You know what I mean? Just right. 70 degrees or warmer. She was perfect. Now, like our short hairs, if we get into some temperatures where they're, oh, 30, 40, low 50s, maybe, you know, they're comfortable and they can run all day, no complaints. You put her, I brought her up to hunt in Kansas and I was up at my uncle's place, which is northwest part of the state. And we went to hunt and she ran, I was actually with my grandpa at the time who lives up in that same area. And we went out to hunt this little walk-in area and she got... I was talking her up, you know, every time you talk up a bird dog, they'll make a liar out of you just yeah. as fast as you say they're good. So I turn this pointer line. You watch this pointer, grandpa, you know, she's going to be real cool. She takes off and it isn't even 10 minutes into the hunt. She comes back hunched up and bristled up and she's cold. She's cold. It's 45 degrees outside and she's too oh, cold baby. to hunt, you know, because she wants 70 plus. Right. And um, she retrieved really well and she would actually get wet enough, not real, real swimming, but she'd go in and get wet a little bit. And if she wasn't thinking, she'd just dive in. And then by the time she figured out what was happening, she didn't love the water, but you know, she, she was one hell of a bird dog. She pointed, she backed, she was steady, staunch, stylish. I mean, she did everything, retrieved a hand. She healed. She was, I mean, just a dream to hunt with. And I kind of got to the point trainer for you. Yeah, (laughs) this was, this was my project. This was my project. And, um, she just a really nice dog. And we, we finished this whole thing and I kind of made the decision in my mind. I think I'm going to stick with short hairs. I don't need to keep this point around. And, and so I'm going, I'm going to go ahead and sell her. And at the time I worked at a facility and I was part of my job was selling started and finished short hairs. And at, you know, 10 years ago, uh, fully finished short hair, we were getting, I don't know, some of them I sold between five and $10,000, pretty big money. You know I mean? Right. And I thought, well, this dog is all of what these short hairs were. And I went, we'll list her and try and get her sold for five grand or something like that. And I can make a pretty big chunk of money for this bird dog that I trained. And I sat on her and sat on her, didn't get any calls. Posted it in the same places I was posting the short hairs. Didn't get any calls. Didn't get any information. I called and people would call and ask for a dog. I said, well, I've got this pointer. No, they weren't interested. She was house trained even. I mean, she lived in the house with me, did all the things. And I finally found someone that was interested in um, 
Oh, and it was right there what the genetics were. And I stuck, stuck. It's right, right on the edge. I'll figure it out. Um, and I get a call and the guy is interested in her papers. Basically he said, I'm some similar breedings and whatever else. But uh, the, pr- the thing that I don't care for is the price. Because I had her listed at that time. I dropped price probably three or four times and I'm down to like $3,000. And I thought originally I might sell her at five. And he, doesn't, he still didn't like the price at $3,000. I said, okay, at this point, I'm ready to get rid of her. It's like, we're borderline to the point of whatever. And I sold Jenny for a a Dan Wesson 357 revolver, a side-by-side Bakel uh, (laughs) 28-gauge shotgun, and yours traded $500 cash. (laughs) So I've got a $350 pistol, uh, $400 shotgun, and cash. $500 cash. So I made out about ooh, $1,200, $1,300 <laughs> on a dog. I originally hoped I could sell for five grand. So right there, I learned everything I needed to know about pointers. Pointers are hella bird dogs, but there ain't no money in them. Yeah. Not, not at least starting where I was at. So, um. But all of that being said, the half-bred dogs that we were talking about, I mean, they made a big part of long before where we're at today, where, I mean, there's a huge emphasis on papers and paper dogs and everything. Um, You're in a time where bird dogs are what you wanted. Right. And usually, you know, Steve's dog down the road and Tim's dog got hooked up because they got out on the farm and they had a litter of puppies of whatever, whatever crosses and... Those you took hunting, they became bird dogs. Yeah, we used to hunt in eastern Kansas, and uh, the guy we hunted on would always go with us. And he had a half collie. What? A half collie. It was one of them the neighbor's dog got out deal. Yep. And it was his dog that got out or bred the neighbor's dog, so he had to take a pup. Hmm. It was half collie and half some hunting dog. Wasn't anything stylish. Sure. But that dog would point, retrieve. <laughs> like you can't believe. Really? Yep. And looked like a collie. Huh. Except it was dark colored. It uh, but you know, had the it was built like collie, had that long collie nose. Yeah. And that's like a point and retrieve just with the best of them. Interesting. So uh it's interesting you talk about that because a collie would be I would typically a herding right. type of breed, right? right? Now, the herding mentality is very, very, very similarly de- uh, connected to the actual pointing instinct mm-hmm. and if you watch um pointing dogs stalk and point birds and move and stalk and point right. um you know it's very similar to that herding and i didn't get to i didn't really know this as much until even more recently i'd kind of heard it and you know had an idea that i understood there was a similarity there from a from a mentality of the dogs themselves but then um, I recently got to go down and work with a buddy of mine's got a cattle dog. That's a pretty well-trained cattle dog. I mean, on the upper side of well started to has a pretty good understanding of what's going on. And, um, to see that like stocking type mentality and then, you know, uh, flushing, if you will, in the bite aspect of it. Um, he used a couple different things like walk up and then watcher. He said, when, the cows were getting a little feisty and that was this cue for, you know, go after her a little bit. If she starts to think she's going to get in your business, that was the best I could read. He's like, watch her. And then he'd go, if the cow came toward him, he'd go after the cow a little bit and she'd back off. And then that right. was how it worked. But that mentality is actually really, really, really similar. So, you know, you, uh, this is really off the subject. This I got a thing to do with hunting dogs or liquor. Okay. But I had a border collie. Okay. And, that dog, I, I had uh, 40 plus head of steers on some wheat pasture, mm-hmm. uh, three, four and a half miles from home. I moved those calves at 40 plus head to my yard with that dog and never got out of the truck. What? I could, I could, that dog, I could give hand signals out at the window what to do. And that dog herded that 40 head of calves. 700 pounds steer calves to my yard and put them in a pen. Yeah, how far was this? About four and a half miles. Goodness. 
that dog was good. I mean, that it was just by pure luck that I got that dog. But that was by far one of the best farm dogs I ever owned. It seems like, um, I mean, it really seems like they're, when you have a good one, it doesn't really matter what you do. You can't screw them up. Right, exactly. I mean, they know what they're supposed to do. They figure it out and they just do it. Yep, yep. And what, what made that dog good, not a doubt in my mind, was I worked him every day. Yeah. I mean, every day that dog was either in the hog pen or in a cattle pen with me yeah. or both on the same day. Hmm. And he was good. I mean, he was good. <laughs> it was so much fun. Just If I had a neighbor, I had to tap and no uh, three different times that a neighbor had a bullet get out. Yeah. Go to the neighbors or something. He called me, I'd take that dog over, and he'd take him back home. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And he could, I had one neighbor had a mean bull. Uh -huh. In fact, he was trying to catch him for days and couldn't and had a tranquilizer gun because that bull would take you. He lasted with that dog about three minutes. We drove that sucker right in the pen. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, the fight was plumb out of that bull. I, I can imagine. But it, it's a real pleasure to have a dog that can do that. I mean, it's just amazing. Working dogs in general, like oh, the yeah. best of their, yep. I mean, you watch a dog that can do search and rescue stuff. You watch a dog that can be a bird dog. You watch a dog that can retrieve and take hand signals and do all those things or a dog that stands steady wing shot and fall. All of those things, the best of their ability is, um, it's very, very impressive to watch. Yep. You know, across it, I've really had good dogs. Mm-hmm. Weimaraners and short hairs. Really? Is there just enough Weimaraner to like calm down the short hair and enough of short hair to make the Weimaraner a bird dog? I don't, I don't know which, which helps which, but the two best dogs I ever owned were that, Weim short hair crosses. Weim short hair crosses. So I think that uh, Weimaraners in general have gotten really bad more recently. You know, I my grandpa had Weimaraners and talked to me about one of the best dogs he ever had was Weimaraner. I think all I can ever remember from his stories is pretty much every dog he owns name was Queenie. You know what I mean? Like he just recycled the name and I was like, which Queenie was this? Well, it was the short hair cross or the Wyme cross. And I'm probably not even remembering this right. He's going to end up, he may watch this sometime and say, no boy, I told you. But, um, it seemed like it was, uh, he had Wymes and I thought, um, when I first started that I would get into wimes. Now, knowing what wimes are of today, it's a, they're fewer and far between as far as the really good ones. And I'm kind of glad that we ended up moving the direction of short hairs, but, um, it's interesting you say that that was, that was the best cross. And I think, uh, the biggest issues that I've seen with wimes though, involve genetic issues, like health issues, not so much true ability issues, but like, um, I worked with a, a wine that ended up having like hip dysplasia. It's like eight months uh -huh. old and it couldn't run around anymore. You know, that's just bad, bad. Uh -huh. But. Well, I thought maybe that here recently they kind of started breeding them more for show and for looks and for hunting ability. Yeah. There's a lot of that. And not to dock the show ring, okay? Because the show is a game in itself and the dogs that compete at that do a really nice job. But when something becomes popular, it's um, it's not the show ring that causes the issue and it's not the the hunting dog breeders that cause the issue. It's when something becomes popular. It's all the people in between that think I can make an extra buck if I'm breeding these dogs. Mm -hmm. And they aren't thinking about it right. They're not thinking about the things that are involved in breeding. They're not thinking about the things that are involved with testing the dogs um, from a health standpoint or an ability standpoint, whether that be hunting or ring related. and then they just end up producing dogs to make money and they're not, they're not looking at anything or they're looking specifically at color. Like they want the blue wimes right. or they want the, right. the charcoal. I don't even know if there's charcoal wimes, but there's charcoal labs. I mean, it's a color thing. Then you're only looking at one characteristic instead of looking at a dog as a whole. And right. when you get into that one characteristic, that's when the problems come around to everything else. So we've got here old Forrester 1920. This is, uh, it says prohibition style. Um, I would say bourbon as a whole has gotten crazy 
and more and more crazy so much so that uh, um, I believe that most whiskey, uh, liquor stores, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, bourbon selections are kind of outpowering most of the other liquors in the store as a general. So this one is darker. It's a little hotter, so it's uh, 115 proof. It's uh, it's not really that hot. Well, it's smoother. It's easier to drink. There's some of them. Let's see. I know this one I've got for sure in here. Might have actually. Yeah, it's a little bit like red pepper. It gets hot afterwards. Yeah, it's kind of got an after. I was just going to say that with you. I agree. Okay, this one. Main flavors again, caramel. That's the, the ones that I feel like are smoother to drink. That main flavor that's uh, be categorized with caramel. Now, this is also interesting. So, I we just opened this. I hadn't even tried this yet. It's uh, dark chocolate spicy. Then it says cherry and sweet. You get any of the cherry involved in that? Then we've got smoky syrup, maple syrup, herbs. I don't know how they determine the difference between syrup and maple syrup, but... No. Well, I don't think it tastes all that sweet. Hmm. I would agree with you on that. But I think it smells different to taste, though. Yes. Hmm. Okay, that makes a big difference. Take a little sip of water. Cut it just a little bit. It got, it got me too. I did better without water. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Woo. What do you think? Yay, nay? Should we add to the good pile, bad pile, medium pile? No, I'd go to good pile with it. Good pile. I kind of like that one. Mm-hmm. Even though it's a little bitier, it's I like that. Yeah, I, I'm. See, I think uh, for me, the the little bit bitier ones, right? It's just a more bang for your buck. You just need a little less. Right. <laughs> Add an yeah. ice cube or two. <laughs> yeah. <Was that laughs> Goes that, a little further. Is that the prohibition one? Uh, yeah. It's the it says prohibition style. Let me look up see, because yeah, they knew what they were doing back in. <laughs> they knew what they were doing. Yes. Uh, let's see here. Go ahead. It's uh, Old Forester, 1920. And I was at the liquor store, and I was looking and asked a lady about a couple different things, and, uh, oh, she didn't have this, and, oh, she didn't have that, but, ooh, she had this one, and this one's real hard to find. And I, hook, line, and sinker, Took her up on that. And then I've been in three other liquor stores and there's bottles of it everywhere. <laughs> so, um, not that it doesn't mean that it's not good, but she got me good. Old Forester, and then it's 1920. They said that this is the, um, it says aging whiskey was not a common thing in the U.S. in the 19th century. Consequently, this was also the era of adding uh, sweetener and acid and tobacco dye. <sighs> Shudder is what it says. I <laughs> did it for her. But a uh, young man named George Garvin Brown, a pharmaceutical salesman from Kentucky, was a man before his time, a visionary that saw that the need for high-quality whiskey. So that's how this was kind of started. Now, that's something that I just mentioned here that was interesting. You need to watch. Do you have access to, um, I believe it's on, do you guys have Amazon, uh, like Amazon Prime account to get stuff shipped to the house? Mm -hmm. You know, that set up. Well, we have to come over and watch it sometime. It's called Neat, like drink, sipping whiskey neat, right? And they kind of talk about a few different things. And that was one of the things that the history of bourbon and how everything is. So they used to add different things like sweet artificial sweeteners to give it, you know, just a standard alcohol, grain alcohol or moonshine that they would make. 
to look like bourbon. So they'd add sweeteners, they'd add their tobacco juices or whatever, and then different types of acids to change the color. They were only looking for color. That's all they cared about, the color of it, a hint of the sweetener for flavor, but mostly go, look, this looks like bourbon. It must be bourbon. And it was killing people, literally. They would drink a you know, however much of it, and it has acid and other stuff, in it, and people were dying from this knockoff, quote unquote, bourbon. Of course, moonshine do that to most people. Yeah, and that's what I mean. That's what they're they're making this garbage basically and selling it as bourbon because it was popular, but it was hard to make because bourbon takes time. Any whiskey takes time to age and whatever else. Right. So, all right. Have you so, ever drank a lot of moonshine? No, no, I have not. Ooh. I got. I know a person that still makes it. Like real legit makes moonshine. Makes moonshine. Interesting. And I can't believe he ain't dead yet. <laughs> or blind or. Uh, I mean, it's two. bad. It is bad. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that I've drank that people refer to as quote unquote moonshine, it's when they've taken um, like uh, Everclear, right? So corn whiskey to the highest proof. And they add different flavors to it, whatever, and cook it down and then put it in mason jars and screw the tops on. And Call it white lightning. Well, these <laughs> these they have individual flavors. So they have their peach flavor and they have their whatever, root beer flavored and all of these different things that they're, they're basically, they're cooking down Everclear. So right. it's not moonshine. It's Everclear mm-hmm. flavored liqueurs, if you will, at that point. But let's see here. So of course, of course I'm not a good judge because I don't like scotch. Yeah, I don't I don't care for scotch. I'm telling you, scotch and moonshine. Ooh, both of them. <laughs> not a good deal. <laughs> so what else to bring up to try? Okay. So we have two more. And then we're gonna we're gonna call it quits. Okay. Works for me. We've got uh then, we were then, just then talking we'll get about serious. <laughs> yeah, and we get serious. <laughs> Um, we've got the, uh, Henry McKinnon, McKenna, excuse me. That was one that we just talked about from the distillery that came up with maybe in cohorts with the other one you were talking about, but then I didn't find anything. So Evan Williams and the Elijah Craig were all from there. Same place here. Those are going to be our middle two bottles. And then the outside, this is actually Buffalo Trace. Now Buffalo Trace is my favorite distillery. Anybody that's uh, heard me talk about bourbon knows that a majority of the things that are part of them are my favorite. Now, this is kind of like we talked about a store store pick, uh, a liquor store pick, whatever. That's what this is. This is their single barrel fairway, uh, yeah, fairway store pick, basically. And this I got from a, a good buddy of mine out of Iowa, Charles. He's actually been on the the show before, so. Um, those are going to be the outside. So the two inside are, are this bad boy. The two outside are this bad boy. So you can kind of see color-wise they're about the same. Right. There's a whole lot of difference. What do we start with? Uh, let's go inside out. Let's go inside out. This is your pick. This is uh, the... This is the. Oh, this is... Okay. Yep, this is it. This, is, well, this isn't my pick. It's the, their pick. But the the store pick, this will be the outside, and that's the one we're going to end on. This is not one of my favorites, I will be honest. Hunter proof. I mean, it's not super, super hot, but it is more than some of the ones that we look at. What's this one? This is 45% by alcohol by volume, which means it's uh, 90 proof. Is that right? I think it doubles. What do you think? Uh, smooth for that strong, but kind of tasteless. It's just kind of like, ooh, it kind of burned, and it's kind of bourbon, but. I'm going to have to say, sorry, Mr. Henry. 
We don't 100% love your bourbon. Yeah, that wouldn't be Sunday whiskey. <laughs> Maybe Saturday afternoon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and it is bottled in bond bourbon. Okay, so you're out of here, sir. Now we got left Buffalo Trace. Okay, so a couple things that we've talked about here. Bird dogs, we've talked about some smoke poles. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that I would love the opportunity to go shoot. Hutchinson's got a Clay's Club. It's not far away. I would love to go shoot that with you. Smoke pole against smoke pole. <laughs> have you still got your have you still got your shotgun? I do. Okay, do you have stuff to load it and oh, everything yeah. else? Okay. Um <laughs> we need to do, do it. We need to go shoot around the clays. <laughs> smoke pole against smoke pole. Do I <laughs> we need we're gonna have to actually ha- we're gonna have to have a judge so that someone can tell us whether or not we hit the dang things. Yeah, we lied each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh now, your gun's percussion cap. It's not a flintlock. No, it's yeah, percussion. percussion cap. Okay. So, <laughs> we need to do it. Now, I'm going to tell you guys right now. I've hunted with this guy a few times, um, and typically when we go quail hunting, he carries a 410, and then when a pheasant pops up, he also kills the pheasant with the 410. <laughs> and I, in all of the times that I've hunted, I, I can probably count on this finger how many times I've seen him miss. With that 410. Now, I don't know how good he is with a smoke pole, but <laughs> I I believe that I can definitely shoot against him. Not compete, not win, but I think there's a chance that I can actually be there shooting at the same targets. And I, I think it's uh, Sunday afternoons. They have like an That's open. Shoot. Yeah, they have an open at... Uh, I know Jess that works for us. She goes and shoots sometimes, so I'll have to find out. They've got a five right. stand, I believe, in town. So rotate through the stands. We get some different shots and everything else. We go through and see. <laughs> smoke pole against smoke pole. We'll be out there, powder horns, patches, <laughs> right. whole nine yards. So if we get the opportunity to do this, we will shoot it. Uh, we will shoot that live so you all can watch and <laughs> and see. Because you and and then the other thing I want to touch on is you said that you the only thing you've got left is prayer chicken. Yeah. Okay. So I've got uh I've got uh family ground. I can talk to my uncle that there's a really good group of prairie chickens on it every year. Really? Yep. So in, you know how to? Yeah. Oh man. Well, I haven't shot a bird chicken in years. Oh, we can we can we can go up there and we can kill we can shoot one. I mean, it's not we're gonna slaughter the herd, but we can go up and kill a prairie chicken. Um, I've got a pretty good idea where they're at on the property usually, and if we get up there first of the season when it opens, I think we got a good shot of getting her done with smoke pole. You know, the last time I went chicken hunting, uh, I can't even think what year it was. My boy was. Probably 12 or 13. Yeah. He's 40 plus now. And it had been a real warm fall. There yep. had been no frost. And there were still a lot of bugs. Mm-hmm. We hunted in a alfalfa field. Really? Because the chickens were coming into that alfalfa field to feed on grasshoppers. Uh-huh. And we shot chickens in an alfalfa field. First time ever. Well, you say grasshoppers. I think that's a big thing that people don't understand because... Um, Birds in general, like I think a lot of times in the fall, right? You hunt around grain. Right. And uh, when birds are being hatched and raised and everything else, they get, um, those chicks get a majority of the moisture intake that they need from actually bugs. It's not dew. It's not rain. It's not drinking out of some puddle. They eat bugs and they get, uh, I'm going to go with, and this is a, you know, I think uh, 78% of statistics are made up on the spot. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. This is another statistic made up on the spot. (laughs) But the... um, There is a real statistic to this, and the bugs make up a huge, 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 huge portion of the moisture that the the young chicks uh, need. So, um, And grasshoppers are a huge feeder. Now, um, it was a few years back, I actually helped... Uh, a good friend of mine set up a surrogator. And if for those you know what a surrogator is, it's a it's a big rectangular container designed to raise birds in their environment 
esque. Basically, you set it kind of in the area that you want the covey to live, and they kind of they do home ish to that in area um, is the idea behind it. And they're raised. They there is a little heater. There's a little feeder, but they're raised away from people interaction. You're supposed to check them kind of once a day to make sure everything's still working. And other than that, they're in nature ish. You open the thing up at the end of, I think, uh, four to six weeks or something to that effect. The birds fly out and then um, they're in their environment that they've been raised. They're wilder. You can kind of help repopulate. And that um, surrogator, they talked about having the ability to potentially add bugs to kind of help the birds, you know, understand what's going on there. And um, I caught a bunch of grasshoppers out of the yard and uh, the the Miller girls actually helped me come catch a bunch of grasshoppers out of the yard. And it was a family friends. And we took those grasshoppers and threw them in. And those things were like little velociraptors. I mean, they'd never seen a bug in their life. And they knew exactly what they were. And they just running around that thing, catching all the grasshoppers, eating them. Gone. They were gone. Yep. I'd caught maybe 30 or 40 grasshoppers and they were gone. So... Yep. Grasshoppers are a huge part. Bugs are a huge part. And I think that um, this is going to get into a whole different topic, right? Why are there less birds than what there used to be? And a lot of people blame it on all kinds of things. The turkey or the clean farming or the weather or the this, that, and another thing. And I think that what people miss is that all of those things are why bird populations are coming down, Right. You know, I heard an interesting story here the other day. The other day, a couple of weeks ago. I got a neighbor kid that is into falconry. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I knew nothing about it other than they take a falcon out and catch game. Yep. So I was quizzing this kid. They don't raise these falcons. Mm -mm. In the fall, he traps a red tail. Mm -hmm. Trains it. And that's his falcon for the year. When yeah. hunt season's over, he turns it loose. Next year, traps another one. Yep. Uh, that's a lot bigger thing than I, I knew it was. And they travel all over to meets. Really? I didn't know this. Uh-huh. They what have are competitions. They do at the meet? What, what, how does the competition work? Well, we didn't get into that detail. Just of it. Uh, well, they have like... Uh, Rabbits they release. Okay, gotcha. They probably get extra points. They catch the rabbit. They right. miss the rabbit. They lose right. points. Like and that. the bird is actually trained to catch it, and he just, he doesn't bring it back to you. He doesn't no, eat he sits it. On he just it. sits on it. Yep. This kid goes all over and wins almost everything he does. Interesting. You know why? He's got a Kansas red tail. <laughs> If that sucker is uh, alive still, it's a good bird. Yeah. They say, the other competition says, if, if anybody shows up with a Kansas bred red tail, they'll win it every time. Interesting. And now, I would I've say said, there's a lot of dang hawks in the state. Yep, there are. And I hunt in a variety of places from North Dakota to Texas. Mm -hmm. No place do I see hawks like we have them right here. No. They're insane. I mean, it's it's unreal the number of hawks we have in this country right here. So I moved back to the state of Kansas, or it'd be to the first time I moved to the state of Kansas in 2006 or 2007, right around 2006, 2007 timeframe, and um, drove out for family stuff on the west side. So my parents still live in Gardner area, which is right mm -hmm. a suburb of Kansas City Metro ish. It's kind of turning into that now. And um, we drove cross state on the interstate. And I I think um, this was a Thanksgiving that Kat, actually, while well, we were still dating, she came down and went to family Thanksgiving and then drove back to Kansas City with us. And then um, she drove home from there when she was living in North Dakota. And she drove with me and we counted, I don't even know how many, but it was just Oh, Non-stop. Yeah. Hawk, 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 all the way home. Yep. You know, we go to where we hunt pheasants in South Dakota. You can be up there a week and see two. Yeah. I can see five every morning from my yard before I ever get out of the yard. 100%. Yep. 
Yep. It's unbelievable the number of hawks we have. Uh, we've got Cooper's hawk. We've got red tail hawk. Yep. We've got a few falcons. And I don't know if I could truly pick them out, but I've heard people tell me that there's a few falcons mm-hmm. around. Um, but I've even heard the statistic that there's like 70, 80 percent. We're back to statistics, I know, but 78 percent of falcons never make it to maturity because they die. You know, they, they don't they don't make it. Right. And um, it's interesting you brought up the the falconry aspect of things. I'd be interested in meeting if this guy's local. I'd be interested in meeting the guy. Um, we've trained quite a few dogs for falconers. And they actually use the dogs to point the, the game. And then they get up close. They send the bird in the air. They use the dog to flush the game. And then they have the falcon land, you know, take it out of the air and then land on it. Right. And then the dog's supposed to respect the falcon. My biggest fear is always for the falcon's sake, right? Or the hawk's sake in this case, right? The We've got a bird dog on the ground that's just pointed <laughs> and flushed. And they say, now you want the dog to come over and then respect the bird? Right. I don't think this is going to happen. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 no. We aren't worried about the bird. That's the least of their worries ever. They say, if that dog comes anywhere near that bird, the it'll get, got it. you know, taloned up. And then that's the end of it. They'll never do it again. Uh-huh. What? <laughs> okay. If you say so, buddy, you know, that's how it always goes. And then it's, but basically the, it's an interesting request that they have because they want the dogs to point and then they want them to flush on command or cue. Right. Basically. And then they want them to stand steady after that. And uh-huh. they bring me puppies and I'm like, well, hey, we can't do this all at one whack. I mean, you're asking a lot of this dog. Exactly. But, um, it's one of those things that's a really interesting topic. I mean, it's it's something I've been interested in. And I don't know what Kansas is. I never looked. But when I was a kid, I looked in uh, Iowa required like a five-year apprenticeship in order to become a falconer, to be able to uh, catch and own and do all of your own stuff. Um, otherwise, you have to be under the supervision of a licensed falconer. And during that apprenticeship, and you're only allowed specific birds during that apprenticeship. And Oh, some Kansas ain't that high tech. You don't think so? No. Hmm. Yeah. Get a bird and go do it. But, uh, now, no, I know and, that- and he said, and see, like in the winter, he'll just take and then they turn their, their hawk loose mm-hmm. and he goes and sits on a perch somewhere and watches while you walk to flush. Interesting. And he said, you'll never see it before the hawk does. The hawk always sees it first. <laughs> That's very cool. So, no, he's got, he's done now, I think for three years and, uh, he's, yeah, he's good. I mean, he's good at it. Hmm. So but that was interesting that you can't beat a Kansas red tail. You can't beat a Kansas red tail, <laughs> which, um, I, that's the other side of it is populations probably seen the same thing around here. Yeah. You can't beat a Kansas red tail. Um, but, uh, coming, coming back around the, the population of bird in this area, Right. Right now, I would say they're pretty low. Right. I agree. Pretty low. I mean, even four or five years ago, when I came, before we moved into this area, I came down and we were looking around and talking to people and doing everything else. And um, there were a few places that I saw big groups of pheasants fly across the road and different stuff like that. I mean, uh, what would you say as far as populations today versus populations in the past? I mean, when was kind of the big Uh, drop off or was there really one? Two years, year before last, it was it was weak. But last year, our weather just really raised havoc. We had uh, really we had wet. record rainfall in May. Yes. You know, we had almost our annual rainfall in one month. Mm-hmm. And that was right when them chicks was hatched. And there was no way they could survive it. No. Our little pond that we've got here was completely spilling over. Right. And, I mean, yeah. up almost 8, 10 feet from where it was usually. Yeah. And... Uh, then in the fall, it got so seriously dry. Yeah. To where, because I've seen good quail numbers all summer. Mm-hmm. I uh, I kind of try to keep an eye on them. Mm-hmm. And I've seen a lot of quail all summer. And they when it quit raining October 1, the quail just started disappearing. And I had seen in years, I would seen one other year in particular, because I had uh, my friends from Colorado came out hunting. The only place we'd find quail 
It was a year similar to last year. The only place we'd find quail was by a water hole. Mm-hmm. And I think when it gets really dry in the fall, the bugs are all gone. The quail have to go to water. Sure. And that's when the predators just clean them out. Yeah. And, and that's I, what I've, I've seen. I've seen a water hole here this fall had three hawks sitting around it. Yeah. And you know, that's why they're there. They're waiting for the quail to come eat. Drink. Oh, hundred percent. And I hunt with a buddy in, um, uh, in Texas, we hunt down South Texas and he hunts with me in a couple of different places, but, um, that's what his deal is. He says, you Kansas guys always worried about them dang hawks. He said, I, I view it as a good indication that there's actually birds in the field. You know, that's what any field we go into. If there's hawks flying around, he's like, we got a chance to find a couple cubby's quail here. If there's no birds flying. He's like, man, is it probably going to be oh, nothing there? Probably nothing there. Cause the birds know, you know what I mean? Right. But, uh, when was the last, uh, when was the last year around here that we had really a, a boom year that we would categorize for pheasants and quail or either? Ooh, it's been four or five years. Yeah. Cause we had a really good one. Yeah. We, uh, I, I don't, I don't keep track of numbers because that's not important to me. That's not what I hunt. Sure, sure. But, oh, here four or five years ago, we had been on a hunt. And at the end of the day, we had 18 quail on the end gate of the truck to clean. That's a good day. And I thought, we shot a covey. Mm-hmm. You know, covey's 12 to 18 birds, always figures a covey. Mm-hmm. So just out of curiosity, I kept track of coveys. You know, if we'd get six birds, I'd go out and get six birds one day, six the next, well, two day total was a shot of cubby. Give or take, yep. If I got up to 18, it was a cubby. And at the end of the year, we were shooting anywhere from 35 to 40 cubbies. And did it consistently for year after year. I haven't shot 10 coveys of quail in the last three years total, I don't think. Yeah. We just don't have them. No. It's just, it's gotten that, it's got that low. <laughs> it's, uh, it comes down to a number of different things, right? You mentioned predators. They, they have to move to water or whatever. You have to think about how few people truly trap these days. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's not worth it. No. I mean, no. from a, a trapping standpoint, that, Every day you got to check your traps. You got money in the equipment. You got money in the lures. You got money in all of the things that are involved in that. And then you got a ton of time because every day you got to go out and te- check them. Right. When you catch the wrong thing you weren't looking for, you got to dispatch or you got to take care of, you got to let go or you got to do whatever. And, you know, I mean, skunks and raccoons and coyotes, and, they'll wear another, them out. Another thing, and this is probably a really sore subject for a lot of people, but. Big money comes in and leases up this land for deer hunting. Sure, they do. They don't want anybody in there. They think if nothing walks on that ground but a deer for 90 days, I'll get to kill a record book buck. Yeah. So they've taken out any chance of any trapper, Mm -hmm. any coyote hunter. They've taken away anything that could control the predator population yep. because they don't want it walking on their deer ground. So we got to think about the things that we can control, right? Yeah. We can, we can help control predators. Exactly. If we, if we trap and we predator hunt in the off season, we can help control predators. Right. We can help control weeds. Okay. So clean farming, which you farm. And I would assume that you fall into the category of cleaner farming. You spray, don't you? In some, in some in degree. In some cases, Yes. So that clean farming, it's part of you trying to make a living and get the highest quality yield and everything else out of your fields. But the more weeds, the more bugs, the more bugs, the more birds, the more birds. So from a a general standpoint, you know, farmers are trying to make a living just like anybody else. And that's the best way for them to do that because the bugs also hurt the plants in a respect. And you plant from you know, road ditch to road ditch, as much ground as you can get, you're trying to maximize your profits because it's not like you're farming in general is not the billionaires of the industry. You know, you're you're just like trying to make a living. No, we're we're tired of doing it for practice. (laughs) I understand. (laughs) 
I understand. And then you've got uh, the things that you can't control, which would be rainfall, weather conditions. Right. I mean, you are um, stuck with what you get there. But yeah, there are a lot of factors that come into <laughs> those things. But at the same time, all of that considered, I believe it's still cyclic. You know, I mean, every... 10 years-ish, you're going to have some kind of a boom or you're going to have some kind of big change. It seems like that's right. pretty a pretty consistent number because when um, I can remember going back to Norton, Northwest Kansas, um, and hunting, going through college area era and whatever else, and, and then I ended up moving to hunt. That's where my family's from, Norton, Phillipsburg, Northwest part of the state. Um, and... We went out. I shoot. I came up. Uh, I came up and hunted the, you know, last week of the season. My uncle went out. And we both shot lemon of pheasants and we bumped a few coveys quail. You know, I mean, it wasn't any big deal. We just went out in a few hours. We were done. Right. And we had the bird dogs out there. We pretty much only shot pointed birds. You know, I mean, it was just, it was a good time. And by when I moved down there, uh, we didn't hardly see. I mean, we didn't hardly see any birds. And now they're back to up there. I mean, they're kind of booming. They've got quail coveys. I mean, you can move this last year. I think they were killing five, six man limits of pheasants and then moving six, eight, 10 coveys of quail. I mean, and then just north of that into Nebraska. I mean, they're moving a lot of birds, but that would be in the vicinity of 10 to 13 years from when that last big boom was. Right. I mean, it's, it happens in cycles. and You know, when, when CRP first came in, it was fabulous hunting hmm. in the mid-'80s, sure. late-'80s. And then the predators caught up. Yeah. And I think that's where we get our 10-year cycle. As we're in the lows with game, the predators leave. Mm-hmm. And then we'll come back, come back, and we'll get another few really good years and that's a good point. The predators will catch on and say, hey, let's move back to Reno County. Yeah. And here they come. Now, neither of us are obviously biologists, but uh, we're not stupid either. And we can see <laughs> patterns and we can see what things, you know, what things are going on. And it's it's pretty easy, whether the, the predators leave or they just flat die out because they ain't got anything to eat. Right, either. exactly. And then as the few that stick around and do it, birds come back. Then they can eat, they can multiply, and they can catch up, and then they overcome, and everything happens in cycles. I I always I think of the year that we got overrun with green bugs. That was in the early eighties, mm-hmm. uh, pre CRP. Okay, everything fence row to fence row in this country was planted wheat. Yeah, the green bugs came in and was bad, and we all knew we was going to lose our wheat crop. Every small town or county road had a makeshift airport set up. Airplanes was flying, spraying wheat fields. We was using parathion. Okay. Which takes all the oxygen out of the field for a certain period of time. That's what kills Uh, the bugs. Okay. Killed birds too. When we started doing that, everybody said, well, you kiss hunting goodbye this fall. We're killing everything. Sure. For the next two years, we had the best pheasant in this country you've ever seen. Really? I mean, <laughs> it was unreal the number of pheasants we had. Interesting. I had it. My bud from Texas come up for a whole week. And we shot our limit of pheasants six days in a row. Took a day off for Thanksgiving and went and shot our limit two more days. <laughs> and, and we'd have that done by noon. Yeah. I mean, there was pheasants everywhere. Mm-hmm. And my theory was they just did real good on green bugs before we <laughs> killed them all. <laughs> yeah, and the birds were smart enough to move out of there or something. Apparently, huh? I don't know, but we had pheasants. Huh. <laughs> or they could fly above the fields, you know what I mean? Apparently, I don't know. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. So I think we need to take a drink, don't okay. we? Okay. What do we got here? Buffalo Trace, folks. Now, this is a special barrel, uh, single barrel bottle for this uh, fairway select, whatever. This was a gift. 
This is uh, a really, 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 really tasty whiskey. Now I pumped you all up. You're going to hate it, but. Wow. Hey, that's could be a winner right there. Yeah, a winner and probably the least expensive bottle that we have drank this evening. You know, that aspect of things. It's the money doesn't always mean everything, right? I mean, it's it comes down to what uh what's good is good. What proof is that? I think 90. Yeah. 45% alcohol by volume, which is, I believe is a 90 proof, right? And it doubled. Cool. Fifty percent's hundred proof. Yep. Stop that. And then fifty-seven point five is one hundred fifteen. Yeah, so it'd be a ninety proof. Now, Buffalo Trace is my favorite distillery. It's actually the first bourbon that I ever tasted. The Somebody said, hey, do you like bourbon? I'm like, I don't know. Sure, whatever, you know. And it was, this is pretty good stuff. And then I've actually I've got a, uh, a good friend. Uh, his name's Wade, and he, he would bring a bottle of some different type of whiskey. And everything that that man brings is good. You know, there's nothing that I've ever tasted from him that he said, this, try this, and it's not good. But there's been a number of different things. And then I started looking, you know, I, eventually – made this connection that every single thing that he's brought, I don't know if he knows it hundred percent or not, but they're all Buffalo trace distillery. Really? Every single one of them, except for uh, one that he really likes, which is uh, an Irish whiskey. And it's called, um, it's called red breast and red breast is a, we'll get it sometime, but it's a, they call it a single pod or I don't know something. Um, but it's Irish whiskey and that's also pretty good. But um, it was a number of different things that we've tasted and we can play that game another night, but we just do everything Buffalo Trace Distillery. I might have put that on my Christmas list. Well, I will give a call to a guy that may know how to get us some more of it. That's, I'm not too sure that is my favorite of the night. Mm-hmm. It's smooth and mm-hmm. having bites, got a good flavor. It's not too sweet. It's not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A little more? Just swallow. Okay. So, all in all, we got the opportunity to discuss a little bit of uh, whiskey. We got to discuss a little bit about birds from how we got started with bird dogs and how um, we've kind of uh, both been able to evolve and then also populations of birds, all the things that are happening around here. I would say that uh, uh, we've made a decision. I would go, if, if you had to pick uh, first pick tonight, I'm pretty Not sure terrible. it's that one. Okay, now what would be the second pick? Uh, tall one there. This one? Not, uh, we had the ocean, yeah. we had the Kentucky, we had the rye. Uh, the rye. Rye would be number two for rye. me. Number two for you? What's your number two? See, for me, I'm gonna have to say this falls in the in the top for sure of what we drank tonight. Is and then this would be that's the 19. Yep, that's the 19. And I may go of that is probably a little too sweet for me. Of what we had, I would probably go in the vicinity of. One, two-ish kind of tie range, because this one's really good. I knew this one. I knew you would like this one. Um, and then this one to be in the top three. So these would be my top three. We may just have a slight different order. And you call this one, two, and then what would be your third if you had to pick? Ooh, I don't know. I know you like this one quite a bit. And then... Yeah, I really did. That'd probably be my number three. Number three, because it's not quite as sweet. <laughs> Well, guys, uh, we we appreciate you watching. Uh, we've had a lot of fun just chatting, uh, talking about uh, bird dogs and whiskey, two things that are, are pretty important to both of us. And 
Um, if you have interest in any of these things, definitely reach out to us. And again, um, we were doing the, the, the flavor wheel things, and I will throw that in the description below, kind of how you can, if you're interested in looking at any more of that. But uh, guys, this is my buddy Richard. I'm sure that you will see him down the road, and we appreciate you all for watching. We'll see you next time.